Saturday night. It is finally the end of the first week of uh, Spooky Season series here on Reapers Underground. And uh, for all y'all out there in Black Flame land that are starting to tune in, this is the time uh, that you need to share this anywhere and everywhere. If you know anyone that is a fan of movies such as 13 Ghosts, um, Trick or Treat, or even um, Scooby-Doo Part 2, this is definitely the time to chat with this extraordinary actor who has been in some of the most legendary films of the last 25 years. So get to sharing. You know what to do. Otherwise, I'm coming for you. All right. Real quick, we're going to take a quick commercial break to our brothers over at Villain Arts Tattoos. Check that shit out. That's right, Villain Arts Tattoos, the largest tattoo convention in the United States in the world. Check them out when they come to a city near you or your city. All right, just to shameless plug, it's out. The latest Morgrot uh, magazine issue number seven, the Reaper edition, is out. And if you missed your pre-order chance of getting one of these babies, 57 pages of awesomeness, uh, you have a chance. Go over to uh, morgrot.com and uh, check out my boy John Sorrell, and he's got a few extra copies. So get over there and get them while you can. All right. Let us welcome to the first time ever on the underground extraordinary legendary actor c ernst hearth how are you tonight brother i'm doing good thanks for having me this looks like it's gonna be some fun <laughs> <laughs> definitely a different experience uh how's it going kyler he says hello uh to everyone so um shoot where do we begin we're talking about you have been in so many super popular films, television, that most people just, they wouldn't know it. <laughs> but you've yeah, managed to, uh, to be in some amazing things. So how I, did you actually get started uh, doing acting? Well, it's uh, the, 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 the two phases. You got the, uh, the in school, the, uh, you know, the uh, doing the, the assemblies and the, uh, the improv and, and what have you. And that all started because when I went to school, the first school that I went to in kindergarten, I didn't know, but this school had a uh, Christmas pageant every year. And that one of their little traditions was, and I don't know how PC this would be nowadays, but the one of the traditions they had was the biggest kid in the school would play Santa Claus in Aww. this 
uh, in this Christmas pageant. And I just happened to be the biggest kid in school and I was in kindergarten. So you have this pageant that's uh, put on by the grade fours and the grade fives. And then Santa Claus, who comes out at the end, is this little five-year-old. <laughs> I was already the biggest kid in the school. So that that basically got me started with acting. And it was just like loving the attention because, you know, the Christmas pageant, who's it all about? It's about Santa Claus at the end coming out with a bag of presents. So I, I loved I loved having that attention. And it just took off from there. I did all the school assemblies. I got into public speaking. I started going to uh, uh old age homes and what have you with a friend of mine. And we would do like little improv games and basically like whose line is it anyway? We would do little things for just to get the, the seniors up and, and active because, you know, nobody was visiting them and what have you. So we would mm -hmm. go and give them an hour or two hours in an afternoon, have some fun. And, you know, it was, but the way I looked at it was, it was, a, it was a way to get attention and a way to get out of class, you know, you know, well, my who my, the hell wasn't gonna do my, that? Uh, my my poor bleeding heart was third, I think. You know, it was like <laughs> the seniors came third in my list. It was getting out of class and getting attention first. <laughs> and so that <laughs> continued on all through uh school, different school plays. I did the miracle worker, I, I did that in high school, and then uh I moved. I was, this was in Ontario, Canada, and one afternoon, a friend and I are sitting in and we're having a coffee at a donut place, and he says, what do you want to do today? And I said, I don't know. What do you want to do? He says, let's go to Vancouver. And I thought, okay. So we were both on uh, student welfare. I, I had been kicked out of my house, and I was living on my own as a student, and uh, mm. so I was free to just jump on a bus and go. So four days later... Uh, which let me tell you, four days on a greyhound, you get to you get to know a lot of people by smell. <laughs> oh man, I can only imagine. You know, <laughs> as as you go from too. as you go from province to province and city to city, you know about eighty percent of the bus gets off, but there's that twenty percent that continues on the journey across the country. <laughs> And so by the time we got here four days later, it was like a little mini party. We were like rolling beers and, and uh, liquor bottles down the aisle and, uh, you know, so no, playing strip poker. <coughs> That's killer. <laughs> I, got here, I got to Vancouver. I was 19 and uh, I got a job working in a bar because when you're uh, – my size, when you're six foot six, 400 pounds, you walk into a bar, that's your resume. You, you, you need a doorman? I'm a doorman. Here you go. <laughs> as, a, as a doorman at a club. And one night, these two ladies approached me and they said, uh, are you in the film industry? And I was like, what? I'm a boxer here. I don't know what you're talking about. They go, well, you have an interesting face. I think you, we could do something with your face. And I thought, Whatever. They gave me their card. I looked at it and they walked away and I thought, bunch of chicks just trying to pick me up. Whatever. Put the card in my pocket, got home, threw the card on my desk. A couple <laughs> weeks later, I'm cleaning up my desktop and I come across their card and I thought, well, whatever. I didn't even really Hell look not. at the card. So I never really even looked at the card. So it was like two weeks later is when I realized that they were talent agents. And oh, shit. so I called them. Yeah, so I called them out of the blue, and within a week, I was shooting my first commercial, and it was Damn. for a uh, it was for a BC chicken growers. It was for the 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 chicken growers association, and it was all the farmers. And I was basically the star of this commercial, and I'm a prisoner eating. You can find it on YouTube. It's uh, BC oh, chicken growers. It's on my. You know, YouTube everybody page. out there in Black Flame Land is gonna look that up like right now. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> this cop wants her chicken so bad that on the way from taking this criminal to uh, to prison, she stops off to get chicken. So I'm sitting at the lunch counter with her and my handcuffs while she's eating the chicken. And finally, she's talking to the camera, and the whole time she's waving this chicken drumstick around, and I can't stand it anymore. And I just lunge forward and rip the chicken out of her hand with my mouth, and then she yells, freeze. I drop the chicken, and that's the whole commercial. But, you know, I had shot that February 27th, 1990. And I had just turned 20 two weeks earlier 
And that was the first thing I shot. And I thought I was a movie star because I was the star of this thing. And I was on uh, bus shelters and I was on the side of buses. And I thought, man, wow. this is the easiest That's business the to get right into. There. And then you got, you got fucking the, publicity that you can't pay for. It's right there. And then the next three, the next three things I did, I was uh, a non-union extra. And I quickly realized that it's not like that first gig. <laughs> oh, all of a sudden I'm working on a show that was on CBS in 1990 called Broken Badges. And right. uh, I'm... I, I took the cab to get to where I had to shoot because all these films, they shoot so early before the bus system and everything is up and running. So I ended, it turned out I ended up making 12, I, I ended up spending $12 more on the cab to get there than I made that day. Oh, no. And then one, one of the other extras and thankfully drove me home back downtown from where we were shooting. But that was when I realized then and there I got to be in front of the camera. I can't be in the background. I it's got to be me. I love that first experience. Oh, and yeah. so I just pursued it and then in 96 uh so that's how I got into the film industry and you know, in 1990 and then in 1996 um I had done stuff on the side like I was still working full-time jobs but I was doing part-time acting gigs here and I sure. had an agent and I was doing things, starting to accumulate a resume. And then in 1996, a friend of mine called me, says, you know, that little, uh, that little short film you did there was like a, it was a, uh, it was like a fan film. This was a 1994. Oh, sure. I had done a fan film for alien. It was called really? alien IV question mark. And this was before there was an alien four. And it was like, what, if there was a sequel to Alien, what would it be like? And so these filmmakers made this film and they put me in it. And somehow this director had seen this little fan film in 1994 before the Internet. So it was like, I don't know how he saw it. I think a friend of his was in it. And my friend calls me and says, he's written a feature film and he's based the lead around you and he wants to shoot it do you want to do it oh fuck yeah <laughs> it was someone i don't know wrote a film for me and they want me in it so at that time i was working as an office manager and i knew that i wasn't going to get two weeks off work so right. i had to make a decision it was like okay am i going to be a full-time actor or am i going to continue working here as an office manager when someone writes a movie for you <laughs> It's like the I mean, universe is yeah. the universe is sort of telling you what to do. So mm -hmm. I said, okay, universe, if you want me to be an actor, then I'm putting it in your hands. And I quit that job and I went and did that movie. And that's the movie that we shot. We finally finished it in 2017. It had a, uh, a long gestation period. It sat on the shelf for 14 years because we basically ran out of money in the 90s. Because that was back when, you know, it was going to be $40,000 to do a 35 millimeter blow up. Everything was analog. So yeah. it was like, it, was, it wasn't it like it is nowadays. It was expensive to make movies back when you had to make movies. <laughs> you oh, see what a flatbed editing system and everything. So then when we saw, we saw a documentary about digital film and how it was coming into its own. And my... Uh, which it's funny, this, that's how I got hired on the film. And then over the course of these years, I ended up becoming one of the producers and ended up becoming producing partner with the director. And we've, we've done a couple other films since. But it was when we realized that we could take all this 16 millimeter footage and get it scanned into a computer. And then all of a sudden we could do whatever we wanted with it. And that's how we finally got the finished film. And he ended up... Uh, doing his own animation in the film. It's called Joe Finds Grace. And we're trying to get a distributor for it. But it nowadays, if we had finished the film in 97, it would have been much easier to get the film distributed because oh, it was yeah. that much harder to make a film. Now, like even when we were submitting our last film to film festivals, they said they used to get 300 films. Now they get 8,000 films, you know. It's like, how how do you weed through all that? That's ridiculous. 
Well, yeah, and then what and what ends up happening is they end up watching like the first two minutes of every movie, and it's like oh, yeah, they're the like, and eh, this sucks, and eh, this doesn't look good. <laughs> it could just have a bad first five minutes, but you know, if that's what doesn't get you seen, and that's what that's what we ran into. It was like you know, at some point you're like, I'm just bleeding entry fees. I. <laughs> <laughs> So Absolutely. yeah, so that's how I got in. That's how I got into acting. That's how I became a full time. And since '96, I've been a. That's all I am as an actor. So it's and, uh, you know it's been a crazy very, business. Yeah, very humble beginnings. Um, you know, just to mention a few that you've you've done, especially in the the '90s. There, Dudley Do Right, um, Crash. Um, Let's see here. I mean, these were these were feature films, people. This that went to the silver screen. Uh, you know what I'm saying? So, and well, you, yeah, uh, Dudley Do Right. Well, that, Dudley Do Right was uh, Brendan Fraser and Alfred yeah. Molina and Sarah Jessica Parker, and uh, the the list just kept going. Alex Alex Rocco, uh, uh, Eric Idle. You know, mm -hmm. kept, uh, and, and that was probably that was my first like supporting role in a in a big Hollywood film, and that worked out great. I went into an audition for four lines, one day's work, and Hugh Wilson, the director, was also the writer and the executive producer, so he had a lot of pull on this thing, and I hit it off with him in the directing room in the audition, and he said to me, uh, "Leave it with me." And next thing I know, he's turned this four four line character into one of the main henchmen of Snidely Whiplash. So next thing you know, I'm working for the next three months instead of one day's work. And then on my last day when we wrapped, I said, uh, how come I'm not in the big dance number next week? It doesn't make sense that my character Shane wouldn't be there with the rest of the bad guys. And Hugh looks at me and he goes, can you dance? So I did a little jig on the spot. And once again, he says, leave it with me. So the next morning, I get a phone call that says, hi, uh, Teamster will be there in a, an hour to pick you up for dance rehearsal. And I was like, what? <laughs> what? So off to dance rehearsal for two days. And because they'd already worked out most of the big dance number, they basically oh. tagged me on to the end. So now the dance number ends with them throwing Sarah Jessica Parker into my hands and I throw her up on my shoulder and do the big ta-da. <laughs> so it's like, once again, I scored myself oh. the perfect situation by insisting that I continue to stay on this movie. <laughs> and people uh, always say, of, not a lot of actors can say they 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 got to 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 grab Sarah Jessica Parker and throw her over their their shoulder. Um, After a few rehearsals on the during the weekend when we were doing the rehearsals, she said to me, Ernst, I, I hope I'm not too heavy. And <laughs> I, she's like a stick. I, I said, honey, I've had hairstyles that have weighed more. Than <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Holy crap. She was tiny. Balls. So yeah, Just that was the a that was tiniest a lady. So that was a great shoot. And then I, you know, ended up getting a couple more days after that. So I ended up being my my first big, you know, supporting role. And then yeah. uh, I was surprised when I, I had one day's work, which turned into a few days work on X Files, the, right. the big famous, big famous black and white episode, the postmodern Prometheus, where they have like the uh the elephant man creature has got like two heads, he's got two heads. And the whole thing is shot in black and white. There you go. Yeah, that's me. That the barn's on fire. <laughs> <laughs> and that was a, that was another one that uh, I didn't realize when I got the role because you know my, my I have the character name of Huge Man. So <laughs> <laughs> they wanted a bunch of town folk to look like the different farm animals and i guess i was i was the the the, the pig or something i don't know the all the like the cow i guess uh why is so it I was whenever why is it whenever directors you know want certain animals they always go for us big guys yeah. um i mean i guess it, it it gets us in there 
<laughs> well, they had one guy was supposed to be like a horse, and he had like a big long mane, like a like a big ponytail. And they had one girl supposed to be like a chicken, so she was always doing this kind of thing. <laughs> and so they had all these different characters, these weird characters. But what they didn't tell me was is that they ended up giving me an upfront guest star credit. So I'm at oh. home with my little with my little VCR recording X Files just to see my my couple scenes. And at the beginning of the film, it says uh, uh, guest starring, and it shows all the guest star names. And then it says, and Sear and Hearth. And I completely lost my mind. I, I think I almost pressed stop on the record on the VCR because I jumped out of my chair. I was like, what the hell? <laughs> I mean, I would have soiled myself at that point. Uh <laughs> and the, great, the greatest part is you have, in the scene, you have David Duchovny and... You have Jillian Anderson, and they're right. in their car as Mulder and Scully driving to the scene of the episode, and she's reading a file, and, and she's reading this article and this letter that was written to this guy, and in the letter it says, I got your name off the TV, and just as Jillian reads that, boom, up comes my name on the screen, so in the late 90s, for the longest time, my demo reel started with Julian Anderson saying, I got your name off the TV. <laughs> so. oh, shit. Um, you know, and it, that makes it so easy for anybody to go back, you know, especially if they're a fan of the show and find your name like that. And now they'll know exactly where to look. And it's like, oh, ah. <laughs> I pop up everywhere. <laughs> oh, man. And then it, it it led you to a remake, actually, of a classic, and I must say, much better done, uh, the, the cast all the way around, is probably one of my most favorite horror films uh, of the, uh, this was what, two, 2001? 2001, yeah. So, yeah, because it came out just it came out like the Halloween after 9-11, so that didn't help. Nope, sure didn't, but it didn't stop it. No. It didn't stop it at all. It's it's become a cult classic. How did this one land in your lap? Yeah, like a lot of the strange auditions I get because of my size. Like I said, at that <laughs> when we shot that film, I was well, I'm still six foot six and a bit so six foot six and a half but at that point i was 400 and no 598 pounds i was two pounds away from 600 you know and everyone always say Ooh. oh you carry it well it's like the fact that you can get out of bed <laughs> you're carrying it well <laughs> well thank but, goodness you know, that's all they said because you know yeah you know, people can be yeah and the, that that's where the the height goes with the, is a good thing to go with the weight because it is. like they they see the width and they're about to say something and then they see the height and they're like never mind. <laughs> you're like so you're and, exactly what the fuck we wanted for this movie. So we're not going to say shit. We're going to kiss your ass. <laughs> so yeah, that's why when they I'd go for auditions and they'd always say, "What's the uh, C stand for?" And I'd look straight at them and I go, "It's it stands for checks and credits." And as long as it's on those two, that's all you need to know. <laughs> That's Unfortunately, badass. now with the now with the internet, anybody can just in two seconds go. Oh, it stands for Carrie. Uh, <laughs> uh, you let the cat out of the bag, not me. <laughs> just you so can't you, know. you can't have your your shtick anymore because everything is out there. And in the old days, you know, people only knew what you told them. You know, right. Yeah, that's why Absolutely. you could have much in the old days you could have a much longer resume. <laughs> it's so fucking well, true. I never heard of half of these films. Yeah, a lot of independence. A lot of independence. Mm. But so, uh, here you are in this with, situation. Uh, 13 Ghosts. With, yeah, Tony Shalhoub and uh Yeah. So I go into this audition. They say they're auditioning the ghosts in a movie called 13 Ghosts. And I thought, well, that's a that's a pretty good role because, you know, there's only going to be 13 ghosts. It's not like it's going to be full. If they put the number right there in the title, you know, you're not going to be one of thousands of ghosts. <laughs> so, 
I thought that's this should be fun. So I go yeah. there and they say, okay, we basically want you to stand on that mark, look at the camera, and just look scary. It's like <laughs> so I just stood there and so resting and then bitch go, face okay. then. <laughs> <laughs> so they had to do that, and then they had us walk towards camera, and then they wanted us to do like a zombie walk towards camera, then show us how you would walk the halls of this house and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And they hadn't really determined the character, like they hadn't really nailed down the specifics of each ghost. They just knew they wanted a big guy, they wanted a little person, they and then they were going to try and work it all out. Because originally when I auditioned, I think my character was called Couch Potato, and <laughs> Concept drawing I saw of him was this big guy who died sitting on a on a couch. He basically ate himself to death, and he's got all these. You see his shirt moving, his skeleton, his body's moving, and all these rats are coming in and out of like his eye socket and his neck, and there's like the rat coming in and out of him. So that was like their original concept. Then, and with each concept, there was like another script. So I've got a stack of scripts in storage for like different versions of the movie. I got one version that was written by James Gunn. It's like, oh. you, know, it's like you know, it's like, because a lot of these guys, they're like uh, script doctors, you know, they, they get hired oh, to come yeah. in and, and rewrite scripts, right? So I've got about 10 different versions of different actors, people that had nothing to do with the final film, right? Wow. Wrote their version. So yeah. another one was, I was like a... a a John of a, of a dominatrix. And I had this dominatrix who was a dwarf who ended up becoming my mother, but she was like strapped to the side of me and she was in a leather bondage outfit. And <sighs> she basically died when I rolled over on her or some kind of oh, thing. Shit. And when you see the black Zodiac uh, in the film and you see the different cartoon, not cartoons, but like illustrations of the different ghosts, mm -hmm. you'll notice the 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 great child and I think what is it the dire mother, uh, the drawing is still sort of based on that concept. So when you see the black zodiac, you'll see, yeah, there that's how we look in the final film. But when you look at the black zodiac, there's still sort of a stylized version of her in like a leather outfit hanging off the side of me, because so much of this stuff has to happen during pre-production like a lot yeah. of artwork and stuff. And a lot of times stuff is based on earlier versions. Mm -hmm. Like when you, there was with Scooby, we'll get, get into it after, but when Scooby-Doo 2 Monsters Unleashed, they had a board game. And the, my, my character on the board game on the pawn was based on one of my makeup tests, not what I looked like in the movie. I was on a Burger King toy that was based on another makeup test, but not what I looked like in the movie. With Dudley Do Right, for example, the film that we shot was an adult oriented, like a novelty trip. Like it was like a film for adults to go back and see something from their youth. But the studio, Universal, thought they were making a children's film, a kid's yeah. film. So they made them reshoot like 40% of the movie and they put in, they added back like the, the, the horse farting and the horse sticking out his tongue and all the, <laughs> the slaps, all the stuff that they thought kids would find funny, uh -huh. they put back in the film and they took out all the adult oriented stuff because at one point, Sarah Jessica Parker's father gets shipped to Florida where he ends up retiring and working at this gay club. And there's like all this adult humor in the film that ended up leaving the film. And then the problem was in the end, nobody went and saw the film because the kids don't know what Dudley do right is. The people who knew what Dudley do right was, wasn't going to go some, see some stupid dumbed down film. But why I bring this up is because they, they do these novelizations of films, right? Yeah. So when you go to when you go to the kids section and you go to the bookstore and you go to the kids section, you'll find a Dudley Do Right novelization of the film for kids. Mm -hmm. But the, the novelization is based on the early version of the script. So it's got the guy being sent to the gay club and it's got the, it's got all the adult stuff in it, but it's in a novelization based for kids. And I can imagine a kid who saw the movie gets this book that's based for him and they're like my reading so it's always like, funny oops. when you know the behind the scenes stories of things that uh 
got left out or got put in at the last minute or changed or whatever. You know, a lot of people, they'll say, I didn't like that film. It's like, well, if you had only seen the film we shot, not right. the film that was released. <laughs> you know, like when I did the A-Team, they ended up releasing the theatrical cut. And then they also had the director's extended edition. Well, the director's extended edition is what we like to call the film yeah, that the right. director made like the way it was and supposed handed, to be. Yeah. yeah, handed to the studio. And then the studio went, ah, too much exposition. Take it out. We just want the explosions. And then you go see the film and it's like, ah. it's just, it's a big mess. Yeah. So then watch the extended edition, which is actually the, it, it's so crazy. So people then think the director made a crappy movie. When in fact, no, it's not the studio their fault. released. Yeah. <laughs> Which, That's the fun know, part is. Thank hell they actually, you know, at least, you know, release DVDs where you do get the movie the way it was supposed to be. That explains why some blockbusters just end up being all action and no dialogue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then when they release the director's version, it's an hour longer. But then all of a sudden you're like, wow, the film makes sense now. Y you like, know, it's like, oh, OK, I got the explanation I was looking for. <laughs> yeah. So why didn't you just release the movie it was made in the first place? And why is because if we take out another uh, 45 minutes, we can sell one more screening per day. And that's all it's about. It's not about telling a story. It's about getting as many screenings per day. So, right, because they focus on the business, not on the show. <laughs> Which you know, a movie like Thirteen Ghosts, it has a hell of a story. Yeah, uh, and it's, it's got you know funny moments. It's got obviously really scary moments as well, uh, and uh, real heartfelt um, emotional stuff, like in the beginning of the film. But uh, you know, oh, that as the opening, family gets I love that in... opening. I would the opening transitions from the everything's fine to the after the fire, all within the one shot as the camera's panning across that room. It's such a it's such an amazing scene. It's powerful, absolutely yeah. powerful. And I like how they took the gimmick of the first movie where the audience wore glasses to see the ghosts. Mm -hmm. And put that into the movie so the characters in the movie have to wear the glasses. Because if you buy the DVD of the original movie, mm -hmm. uh, uh, they it comes with a pair of 3D glasses. And you can watch the movie with the 3D glasses. And it's it's so stupid. <laughs> it goes <laughs> like really bad 60s uh, animate. Uh, like uh, the image comes across the screen. It's a skeleton. Ah! Oh, absolutely. Um, let me see here. Kyler says, man, the amount of lore I read about 13 Ghosts, you played the character well. And Thank he you. says, Kyler also says, I prefer the director versions of movies the way it was meant to be. So yeah. that just goes to show you, you know, everyone agrees. We want the whole thing. Don't give us and a that, chopped up version of it. It's and that's boring. why physical media physical media needs to stick around the problem is with these with so many of these streamers it's like you get the version they put out and then that's usually it there's no there's no extras there's no director's cut there's no uh, backstory there's no commentary there's no nothing and the worst part is they can pull it at any point and then it doesn't exist which is insane <laughs> You know, or they don't even release the movies like Warner Brothers is doing. And they just, they say, oh, it's a write-off. And it's like, you mean 400 people work for half a year or two years for nothing? Right. <laughs> it means it's like, nothing. what the hell? <laughs> what was the point of doing Thankfully, it if you're not going to keep it in there? Well, that's like Trick or Treat. When I worked on Trick or Treat, it was supposed to be a theatrical release. And then they got shy because I think Saw was a uh, sequel to Saw was opening the same weekend. And then there was another rumor that it was because there were too many women leads and nobody wants to see that. And then there was a rumor oh, about the, kid, the kids in the school bus scene. It was it was too graphic and nobody wants to see that. And I think it came down to that. They didn't want to release two horror movies the same weekend and break the uh, 
and break the box office in half. I think they knew that the Saw sequel was opening, and I think it was something as simple as that. Or they just didn't have enough faith. Who knows why these – all it takes sometimes is the decision of one person to rubber stamp something, yes or no. And there is no rhyme or reason. And, you know, you end up waiting two years and hope that it comes out on DVD. And thankfully, with the uh, festival that it went to, it got enough of a word of mouth that people were like, we got to see this. I mean, the fact that they they, they re-released re it into theaters last year just yep. shows you. Just like with 13 Goes, both of these films have taken a life of their own and have just gotten bigger and bigger the more people see it. I mean, Trick or Treat is, I mean, Little Sam is one of the most widely bought collectible items, um, cult following, uh, in my opinion, one of the best anthologies uh, since, uh, you know, Creep Show and, and some of the, the ones before that, uh, Tales from the Dark Side. And they all feed into each other. So let's uh, let's tell everybody a little bit about your character uh, in uh, Trick or Treat. <laughs> uh, so uh, I I play uh, Anna Paquin's blind date that she doesn't know that her sister is going to find someone for her. And we think at the beginning of the movie that it's just a blind date. It's just a romantic thing. They're going to a, they're going to a, a party in the woods and they're setting up uh, blind dates for everybody. But uh, turns out they have other plans. But the best part of it was when uh, she says to her sister, is he young? And they cut to me dressed up as a big giant baby. And it's like, yeah. it's like, you can't get any younger. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, when I saw the, the breakdown for that character, I said, I got to get this because it's such a beautiful uh, homage to my character from, from 13 ghosts. It's like, it's, yep. a, it's like a perfectly designed Easter egg for anyone who knows their horror films, <laughs> you know, to know that the guy who played the big baby in this film is the same guy playing the big baby in this film, both Warner brother releases. And the funny part is, I lost over 200 pounds by the time we shot Trick or Treat. So I look like the great child's baby. You know, I... <laughs> <laughs> I'm half the man I used to be. <laughs> and this time I, I got the... They got the, 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 the addition of the bonnet and I got the booties. Which I thought time. was perfect. I thought it was perfect. This time I actually have a diaper, whereas in 13 Ghosts, I just had a pair of white jockeys uh yeah, that yeah. were you know stained stained brown uh but i like to i like to know yeah, my yes. my biggest part my my biggest trivia is knowing that under those i'm wearing a gold lame thong but nobody knows that only i know ah. that well now you know that <laughs> now that that picture has been ingrained into the uh, black so flame the, universe the child was was very fabulous as he was walking around with his Golem May thong on. <laughs> so uh, when the guy, I have to ahead. say, I, I have to let the, the, the fans know, I've seen at least two people who have framed copies of my underwear from 13 Ghosts, which is a bizarre thing to say. But I have to let them both know that neither of those underwear touched my ass crack. <laughs> because I had gold lame thong on underneath. So I'm sorry if you were hoping to get some DNA out of it. But <laughs> it's like fucking Tom Jones, you know. Uh, I, 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 did I get the man's silk boxers? Uh... <laughs> you know, it's funny. I was watching, there's a, a thing on Netflix about uh, crazy people with their crazy collections in their homes and stuff. And there's one guy that has a, a whole horror theme in the basement and that's where i saw my underwear hanging there framed with the little rattle that, that they show in the movie <laughs> that i never actually use but in the 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 ghost files on the dvd where they tell the backstories because now yep. everyone is thinking about for the last 10 years that word has been on the street everybody wants to see a a series based on the backstories of these ghosts oh, and how cool you know on the deep on the DVD, they had those extras where uh, 
they told the ghost stories of all the different ghosts and everybody saw that and was like, why didn't they put more of that into the movie? And I think they should have Green put time. they should have put some backstory to the ghosts. I think that would have been the only thing that would have improved the movie was to, to show a little of the backstory of each ghost. They did a little bit of it with the the, the uh, juggernaut at the beginning. Yeah. But it would have been nice to see, especially considering they made that whole feature for the DVD extras. They could have just taken stuff from there. I mean, the truth is there's got to be at least five minutes, too many shots of hallways in the film as it is. We could have replaced that with That's some backstories. <laughs> it's like, oh, we need an extra five minutes. We'll show this hallway. Look, it's empty. Dramatic effect. Was, ooh, another hallway. <laughs> but I was saying to someone else uh, a, a while ago, I think one reason why the movie has gotten more and more popular is, and this sounds silly, but as the screens people are watching it on have gotten smaller, it has become mm -hmm. more successful because it has such fast paced editing and right. it's, it's so quickly cut together. When you saw it that opening weekend on a big, massive screen, your it was like your brain was over, overwhelmed. It couldn't handle. It's like I'm looking at this side of the screen, and I've already missed what's happening on this side. And so, not until it came out on DVD and people got to see it on their TVs, mm -hmm. all of a sudden it was like you could see all the action. You could see the cuts on the screen as they were happening. Because I remember at the premiere that was the the complaint amongst a lot of us was that the screen was too big for how fast it was like, almost like it was cut like an MTV music video. With yeah. The loss of the facts I, cutting. I, I could definitely see that. Yeah. And so as now that people are watching it on their TVs, it's like, it must be amazing. Because you can see all of it happening. You know, I think it's one of those, uh, one of those things that it's just uh, behind the scenes. You're not even realizing that you're, it's just like your brain is watching a different film the smaller the screen gets. And oh, yeah. That's my theory. No, nobody needs to agree with it. I like it. Absolutely. <laughs> and after doing this film, how did it impact your life? Well, um, like I was saying to you earlier before we went on, seeing your face tattooed on people. That's one thing that has, of all the characters I've played, there's none that anyone has really wanted to put on their face and why would you on their, on their body. And why would you? It's to, but for some reason, I think it's because it's all the ghosts. Like most people, most of the tattoos I've seen, they've been like sleeves on an arm or sleeves mm. on a leg. And they have all of the, the 13 ghosts or the 12 ghosts wrapped around their, their leg and I'm just one of but what for me that's the most trippy of that is that you know I don't have any make everybody was wearing makeup in the film everybody's wearing all these crazy outfits I I got two little piece prosthetic pieces that go over my eyebrow and that's it it's just me so <sighs> when you see when you see your face just your face on some stranger's thigh. It's a little, it plays with your head. Yeah. When you, and I'm sorry about the mess there, but the, the baby had a <laughs> bit of a sick tummy. And uh, the great part of that puke was it wasn't puke. It was like latex and it had chunks in it. So once it was placed, it never moved. It never shifted. <laughs> it never melted. It never did versus trick or treat where the, I was supposed to be drinking and got sick from drinking too much alcohol and I puked up all over myself. So the puke that they put on me in 13 in uh, trick or treat was made from uh, potato and leek onion soup and <laughs> uh, beer or well, uh, non-alcoholic beer. Cause that's what I was drinking in my baby bottle uh -huh. and um, chunks of hot dog because, you know, it was supposed to look like I upchucked all my food for yeah. the day. And so that's what I had running down me when you see me passed out. So I've got that beautiful smell in my face. And Ooh. then three months later, they decided they wanted some extra footage of the giant baby after the wolves had their way with me. 
And so they did a bunch of scenes where you see the giant's baby's neck ripped open and you see yep. them, them going down, going to town on me. And that was scary well, I'm sure as hell. Because, so mad at that. Yeah, that, that was scary as hell because you have these big animatronic wolf mouths going on, Whoa. closing in on your, on your actual, and it's actual teeth on a motor. It was scary as hell. And no shit. Another piece okay. of trivia for people. I was people. curious how they did that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, no CG. I had a big freaking wolf with razor sharp teeth con constantly coming in down on my throat. And another piece of trivia is those are the same wolves from Underworld, which they had just shot I in Vancouver. It. And I think they spray painted them black or they darkened them because I think they were white. So mm -hmm. those are the same, the same ones. It was the same people doing the, the, yeah. So there's a lot of sharing when it's the same company doing the same effects, you know, happens hey, a lot. Why the hell not? You know, <laughs> at least especially you get your when, money's uh, worth, you know, <laughs> you know, uh, and the, the, the Jason, the, not the Jason, the Sam head. I like mm -hmm. they had the animatronic version and then they had the, uh, they also had, uh, the Quinn Lord version. Mm -hmm. It's so weird to see him full grown now because to Isn't me, it? trick trick or treat doesn't to me, trick or treat doesn't seem that long ago. It still seems recent to me until I see a picture of a grown man and then someone says, That's Quinn. I go, No, Quinn's a, oh yeah, wow. You, you don't see the 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 how much time has lapsed until you see it through a child. And I did a movie with him even before, uh, no, it was after that. It was called Space Buddies. And he was oh, one yeah. of the little, it was one of those talking dog movies, uh, the Air Bud <laughs> movies. And he, he was in that. All, and I was, he was tr trying to break into NASA to get his dog. And I was the security guard at NASA telling them they, uh, they had to come with me. And it's, it's so funny when you're constantly working with, the same actors from different different projects as different characters but uh no so it's been it's been good because i i get my most fan mail from 13 ghosts until i did scooby doo 2 monsters unleashed and now i get i get a lot of fan mail for minor 49er that i played in scooby doo 2 and it's crazy because it's Two different audiences. I get like a lot of kids from Scooby Doo, and I get a lot of their adult parents. But then at, now that the movies have been out for twenty years, I the, the 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 audiences are just all jumbled together because the people. There I am. Yeah, <laughs> that was six hours of makeup and two hours of wardrobe every day for the entire. I was on that on and off for seven months playing minor forty nine er. So. And if, that was the first project I did after losing 200 pounds. And the first thing they told me was they were going to have to build me a fat suit. So, <laughs> but my wife was right. She said, at least you can take it off each night. And exactly. uh, I didn't have to go home with it. But no, that was no. A, that was a hard one. Um, that was a, a lot of work on that film. Hey, buddy. Johnny Logan Harley says, hey, buddy. Welcome, Johnny. Great, great artist who's done some great, uh, great artworks of my uh, couple of my characters, and it's always nice to get fan art. It's always nice to see people doing very appreciating the work that you've done, like the picture that you have on the screen. Uh, Neil Fraser in Scotland. He's a uh, poster designer, and I got oh. him. I commissioned him to do that for me. That's a photo I sell at conventions, and it's also uh, my banner for conventions. I got him to do ten of my most famous characters, and my favorite thing is always getting people trying to see if people can recognize how many of the characters on that photo people can recognize because. A lot of people don't recognize me from film to film. They know my characters. They don't know that they don't necessarily know the person who plays it. Like even on Scooby Doo 2, I wasn't in Scooby Doo 2. Minor 49er was in Scooby Doo 2. When I was working on set, for example, like Freddie Prince Jr., 
he wasn't working with Sear and Star. He never saw Sear and Star. By the time he saw me, I was minor 49er. By the time I went home, he went home, I was minor 49er. So there's a lot of people that worked on that film who have no idea who I am to the point that you'd be standing on set and they would just walk over and start poking your belly. And you almost want to go, hello, oh, there's a human in here. <laughs> Because it's so easy to I, lose know, sight, and you be, you just recognize everybody as the characters they're playing, and especially on Scooby Doo, where you know it's not Matthew Lillard, that's Shaggy. Everybody knows what Shaggy looks like, you know exactly. And so it was nice to be part of that world. So I've been part of the Scooby World twice because I was also in the third film, the live action film called Scooby Doo: The Mystery Begins, where they went back to high school. That was like one of my absolute favorite. Uh, films of that series it was so much fun to see everybody in high school and you knew shaggy was getting high all the time yeah but to see how how scooby was found how scooby came into the picture how the the different the different guys who were all in different uh cliques at school none of them were really friends of each other but they all became friends and that was fun because instead of being minor 49er, one of the villains in the second film, I got to be the uh, the, the possible villain of the episode because they think I'm the bad guy. But I just turn out to be a happy janitor who likes to dance and uh, wants to be the, the next dancing star of America. And uh, that was a fun one to do because that was with Brian Levant, direct dad, who he directed the... the um, the Jingle All the Way, and he directed the, the Flintstone movies. And I worked with him on Are We There Yet? The film with Ice Cube. So I, I say, had worked with him on that. You're even in that one. <laughs> yeah, I'm the, uh, I'm the truck driver when he gets to Canada and uh, Ice Cube has to flag down someone to uh, chase after the other trucker with the two kids. He flags me down. And that's when I say, hey, and if you notice when you watch that film, uh, that's another thing where I was telling you earlier about from each script version that comes out, things change and the concept yeah. of the characters change. Well, on that film, uh, the character name changed so many times. There was a uh, young affable fella. There was truck driver. And then at one point I was supposed to be driving the Oscar Mayer Wiener mobile. And <laughs> my character was um, hot dogger. And so then they change it because I think once I think once Oscar Meyer realized that uh, I was driving crazily through traffic, I don't think they want their their Wienermobile uh, associated with reckless driving, you know. Oh, so then for that, hell. Come on. that licensing didn't go through. But unfortunately, my my beautiful embroidered, embroidered chair back was already made. So I've got this beautiful chair back that has the, the Are We There Yet logo, the driver's license and everything on it. And then when you flip it around, it says Hot Dogger. You know, it's like <laughs> most films, it says your your name, Seer and Starth, right? So it doesn't matter if they change the character name. I got my nice chair back, but this one just says Hot Dogger. So I have to constantly say, no, this is really me. This was what my character was named. But the funny was, because they kept changing the character's name, eventually they would just refer to me as Ernst in the script. It's just like right. they knew I was playing the part. They don't know what to call me. So they say, okay, Ernst does this, Ernst does this. And so when I read that, I thought, I like the fact that my character is named Ernst. That's cool. Right. I mean, that's, gonna, your, that's your fucking name. <laughs> well, I'm going to guarantee that my character's name stays Ernst. So when we went to shoot, every sentence, every word, everything that I said, I said, well, come on in. Ernst knows how to drive. Ernst is the best. Ernst will get you there. I just threw in Ernst into every sentence. And <laughs> there was no way around it. It stuck. <laughs> So it's like Ernst knows how to get you there. Ernst will get you there. Ernst will... So that's why now when you see the you see the the, the credits at the end of the film, it's Sears to Earth as Ernst. And it's just so perfect when you can have a, a strange German name, but you can still get it in there. You know, only because they, they ran infectious. out of character names. <laughs> just uh, an absolute uh, inspiration. 
to and, big guys all over the place. Cause I mean, I'm six, two, um, 289, you know, always been big stocky, the one that they would always pick to, to, you know, I don't know. I, n- I never did any like, you know, formal acting or anything like that in school, nothing like that, but I was always a performer. So when I became a drummer, I mean, I was on stage yeah. all the time and then touring for the last 25 years, you know, as a professional drummer in the metal scene. So, um, you know, if anybody in the film, I was just going to say, if anybody has, has uh, told a fib, if anybody has lied to their parents, if anyone has said that they weren't out drinking or they were at the library or they have their friends studying, you know, then you've acted. <laughs> You know, it's like if you need to act, just think back to the last time you told a lie. Because the, that is the, so the, damn the, true. The goal of a lie is to make the person believe that it's true. So that's all we're doing. You know, so when people yeah. are like, I couldn't be an actor, you've acted every day of your life. Nobody is the same person all the time. You have the person you are yeah. at work, you have the person you are at conventions, you have the person you are at concerts, you have the person you're at the bank. You know, it's like everybody gets a different version of you. That's the same thing. But the problem I've had is my characters that I've played have had such uh over the top, have been such over the top characters, and the wardrobe that I've worn. What has happens is you forget to take them off sometimes from roll to roll. And so you end up having all of these characters build on top of you to the point like where head, yeah. you, you don't know who you are anymore because you're like acting through all of these layers of characters that you've played. So whenever I do an audition, wherever I'm on camera doing a self tape, it's like at the hardest time, just being me, it's like, Parts of different, my wife, when she's doing the reading and I'm doing a self tape for an audition, she's like, well, that line sounded like this character. And that line, it's like, because (laughs) I I end up, I have a certain way of saying certain lines or certain things. And it's so hard after a while when you've played so many over the top crazy characters. Like I have friends who they've got over a hundred roles on their resume, but 85 of them are playing a cop, you know? So it's like, (laughs) You know, they're good. They're the guy. They're always in that mentality. There's always someone who plays FBI and something. There's always people who play doctors and judges and stuff. And the problem with the business is you get typecast. So if you're good at playing a judge, next thing you know, you've got 50 judges on your resume. And when you're good at playing over the top freaks of nature, you're going to have a lot of you're going to have a lot of those on your resume. And that's what I have. And my biggest my biggest challenge has been getting normal guys on my resume, just happy go lucky, the the friendly neighbor, you know, the guy. Um, That's why the last film that I did that is on Paramount plus crawl space, where I Mm. starred with uh, Henry Thomas, our Elliot from uh, Mm ET. There was nothing about the character that was, uh, oh, supernatural. One. I played oh, sloth in that. I was one of the uh, the seven deadly sins. Uh, the Magnificent Seven. That was season three. And I, don't know I like Crawl Space because... My apologies. <laughs> yeah. Crawl Space, I was just a big guy. I was just a big guy, but it was nothing to do with the character. The character could have been any size. And mm. I like those kind of roles where it's like, you know, you've been chosen for your acting you've been chosen because you're an interesting character not because it's a sight gag where they just want you know big fat guy fall down go boom you know which is fine i've got a but you know after so many years you want to be able to stretch it's old. you want to be taken seriously yes <laughs> and now you throw enough money at me i'll put on the diaper again you know it's like they they keep saying that are you going to be part of this new series where the backstories of the 13 ghosts and it's like you throw enough money at me, I'll put a diaper and bib on again. And, oh, I had mentioned with 13 Ghosts, I was going to tell you the, the story of how my look came to be with my hair, because everyone always makes fun of that blonde tuft of hair I have on my head. <laughs> and I was at a makeup fitting and test, a camera test, and I was standing outside. Talk. I had a pretty good size afro at the time, so I had lots of hair. And I'm talking with the director, Steve. And we're trying to figure out a look for the giant baby. And just then Shannon Elizabeth comes out of her trailer and she's walking by and Steve J 
just decides he's going to poll her. Mm -hmm. Two L's. Um, sorry, just made a mess. Um, and he asks her, what kind of hair do you think um, the great child should have? And she says, oh, you know what would be funny? You remember there in the, in the I think it was in the 60s or the 70s, there was this cartoon character. He was like a big duck. And he had like a bib. <laughs> And he had on like a rattle and he and he had like a big tough big curl in the front. And Steve goes, Baby Huey? And she goes, Yes, baby Huey. It would be so funny if he had like just a big curl. Next thing you know, I'm getting sent to the getting sent to the makeup trailer. They shave off my afro. All they leave is a big tuft of hair in the front. And sadly, that tuft is not there. I, I couldn't even do it nowadays if I wanted to. <laughs> But um, they shaved everything off. They left a tuft of hair, and then they dyed it bleach blonde. And then every three days, I had to go in and get my roots touched up because you could start seeing the dark hair coming through, and we can't yep. have that. Um, <laughs> and at the beginning of the shoot, I was, like, wearing baseball caps when I was out in public, and I was so embarrassed because I, if I took my baseball cap off, I looked like the ass of a poodle, right? So... <laughs> So I was wearing baseball caps and everything. By the end of the three months, I'd be out in public. I had little barrettes in my hair and everything. And it was like, I was just living it because, you know, I had a story that went along with it. It wasn't, it wasn't my normal look. This was what Shannon Elizabeth made me look. <laughs> Thank you, Shannon. <laughs> it was a good look. But when we, we ended up doing reshoots three weeks or th a month before the film opened, we had to do reshoots, which sadly was on 9-11. The, the, the exact morning that that happened, we were in the studio doing research shoots for 13 Go. So I'm standing there in my underwear and my bib and my puke doing my scary eyes. And then they'd yell cut. And then we'd run all run over to the monitor and we'd watch what's happening in New York. And then, okay. And then we go back to set. So it was such a surreal day to start oh, with. Goodness. Like, so if you know 13 Ghosts, you'll know at the end of the film, once the house is exploded and blown up, there's a shot where you see the ghosts. We've been freed from the house yep. and we're all wandering into the woods, all happy. Yep. And, and I think the jackal is dancing and we're all going off into the <laughs> <Yep>. woods. <laughs> that didn't exist in the first in the film we shot. That was something that we went back to reshoot that scene. So that shot was reshot on 9-11 so for me 9-11 will always be a bizarre surreal day because it's like i have this thing that went on in the world but then i also and for that i didn't do my hair again they sh i shaved my head and they actually put a tuft so the guy <laughs> that bought my underwear in the same photo in the same frame he has my tuft of hair next to my underwear no and shit. i had to tell him i had to tell him that sadly that that's only from one little one little scene because of a reshoot. That's not what I wore in the whole movie, but it's still film worn, I guess. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, it, I, it, you had it. Uh, they put it on you, so you know it's, it's just amazing. bizarre when you see. I remember walking down the street one day. My uh, my uh, stepdaughter was in town. We were out uh, doing the tourist thing, and we're walking past the store downtown, and they had movie memorabilia and and stuff from different famous movies and TV shows yeah. in this big display. And I'm standing on the corner and I go, boy, that thing looks so familiar. What is that? And I go up and I look at, they had a little uh, Polaroid shot stapled to the outfit. And it was a picture of me from an episode of Outer Limits that I did many moons ago. Right. And that was yeah. my spaceman outfit that I wore in that. And, <laughs> uh, you're like, yeah, there's a picture of the past. <laughs> when I was a big, like the, the 600 pounds that I was, I played a character named Silverface, and I basically looked like a, uh, I basically looked like a, uh, a big pinball. I looked like a big silver ball in the episode because my outfit is shiny silver, my head is shaved and painted silver. I'm called Silverface, and <laughs> it was with Colin Mockery. And Mackenzie Phillips were in the episode. And Colin Mockery and I 
had we had to start the episode off with this big, basically this big improv fest. The director, Michael Roll, was part of theater sports, which was a big improv thing that Colin Mockery was a, used to be a part of in Vancouver. So they were friends. They were old improv friends. So he knew how well, everyone knows how well Colin Mockery can do improv from 25 years of whose line is it anyway. Now oh, I'm in yeah. a scene with him and I have to improv off of him. And now I'm supposed to be funny. And it's like, oh, God, geez, thanks for uh, putting me up against, against the best improv guy in the world. And, you know, he's looking at me and he said, he, at one point he calls me the Jolly Green Giant sex toy. Uh, <laughs> another one of his improv insults, he goes, why don't you hang a wreath around your nose because you're brain dead. And uh, <laughs> the best I could come up with was uh, when they say a man loves a man and when they say a woman loves a man in a uniform, they don't mean a rent -a cop baldy. And, you know, it's like <laughs> when in when in doubt. Go after the obvious. He's bald. I'll call him Baldy. Get it? <laughs> I mean, it works. It was so bizarre seeing my my outfit that many years later, just in a in a in a movie display on the side of the road. But uh, That's something. yeah, it's been a it's been a career of those kind of crazy characters. And you know, who gets to be on out? So, like I was going to say, I was in two Scooby Doo's. I got to work with Kermit the Frog in a Muppet movie. I got I was in Muppets Wizard of Oz. So. I got to uh, work with Kermit and who else was in that? Queen Latifah and uh, Ashanti, David Allen Greer. Uh, so I got to work. Quentin Tarantino's even in that movie. Um, right. Uh, he plays himself and and uh, right, yeah. And uh, uh, <clears throat> Kermit is pitching him movie ideas. <laughs> so, <laughs> Could you so imagine? I got to be in that. I got to be in, I got to, one of the most famous comics of the last 50 years internationally is uh, Asterix and Obelix. And uh, it's the one of the biggest cartoons in the world for 50 years. And they did two big uh, computer generated feature films. Uh, and I got to play Obelix, the main guy in two of those. So I got to be, I've got all these parts of childhood that I've got to, oh, and I've done, uh, I did an Air Bud movie, and then I did a, a Santa a Search for Santa Paws. I did Space Buddies. So I've got all these talk Disney talking dog movies, and then on Damn. the flip side, I've got uh, you know uh, the ABCs of Death Two, where I'm jamming a penis in my mouth. So you know, it's like <laughs> <laughs> you'll find me everywhere. <laughs> It's just unbelievable the depth of, you know, um, and I was I was saying this to myself earlier. I'm like, you know, every actor that I've talked to, not, you know, necessarily on, on my show, but uh, just because I'm starting to get into film now. I, you know, I my first one is a is a zombie film. So it's like I can cross that off my bucket list. I've been a zombie and I fucking loved it. Because, you know, monster characters, serial killers, slashers, like that's my thing. That's what I would like to do. Now, I really want to do demons. Obviously, uh, you know, I could do vampires, whatever the fuck, you know, give it to me. I'll, I'll pull it off. Um, and it's like everyone's always like, well, I really want to be featured more and blah, 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 blah. It's like you have been in so many iconic films not necessarily, you know, as as a as a main character in some you have, but for the most part, a lot of them were supporting roles, and it's memorable. Yeah, you know, it's I like have, I don't know I why have... people don't think it's possible to have a career like that, and you've done it. Yeah, you know, uh, like I was saying to you earlier, Woo! in there's uh, there's famous, and then there's horror famous, and I've noticed with the conventions, especially. Uh, everybody that has been in, and it can be a, a, a no budget horror film that you see on Tubi that no one's ever heard of. The, the fact of the matter is in this, in, in this world, everybody is a fan of, of a certain film and they yeah. may be the only person who's a fan of that film, but everybody is famous to somebody in this business. And, you know, you may have only been in one film when you were five years old, and but that film is a huge, you know, that's there so are people at conventions true. that to this day 
you know, 30 years later, they've only ever been in one film, but they're doing the, the convention circuit because they're memorable. They stood out. Like the kid in the Deliverance, the little kid who's playing the oh, banjo. Oh, yeah. You know, immediately you know who that is. You know, nobody knows who is what his name is or anything, but you know the character. And that's the biggest thing I've had is people, nobody knows who I am name-wise other than people who have done the... Uh, who have done the uh, the, the deep dive, uh, but they know the characters I play. I have people, I'll be driving, walking down the street. I had this happen with a city bus. Um, a bus is driving by. All of a sudden, the bus hits the brakes in the middle of the road. The driver opens the door and yells, pancakes! You know, it's like he recognized Mr. Campisi from Say It Isn't So. And all of a sudden, the bus driver is yelling pancakes out. I don't know what the people on his bus thought was happening at that moment. The bus driver was oh, probably his scared mind. the hell out of them. <laughs> <laughs> They're all like, but why? I get that, that kind of stuff. I get people chasing me down in airports for 20 minutes, following me through the airport as I go from 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 uh, one terminal to another. And you think some somebody is, you know, stalking you. You don't know what's going on. And then you find out it's somebody that recognizes you from Dreamcatcher and uh, they just want to get your autograph, but they're too shy to say anything. But, you know, you've noticed them for 25 minutes as they've been following you through the airport. You know, and Dreamcatcher was a, was a hoot because. It's a Stephen King film. It was written and directed by Lawrence Kasdan, Academy Award nominee, winning actor, director. I mean, the guy who wrote Empire Strikes Back for him. Um, you know, and uh, um, then it was written by William Goldman, an Academy Award winning screenwriter. So it was like, I got to knock three big names off with one film, you know. Fucking hell, and that's huge. And I'm the first person you hear in the film. I'm the first five minutes of the film. And then they bring me up later on in the film. So it's like, I love it when you, you've, you've left the film. Oh, thank you, John. I love it when uh, uh, they t you, get, you leave a film or you die in a film and they continue to talk about you later on in the film. That's always a nice little ego stroke. You know, it's like, uh, <laughs> my wife made fun of me. She said, uh, she goes, whenever you die in a film, it's never just a, a a a nothing death. It's like they'll have a memorial moment for you. It's like I did a movie called Monster Island with uh, uh, Adam West. I got to work with Adam West. He played a, a oh mad scientist goodness. called Dr. Harryhausen. And he was called Dr. Harryhausen because the movie had was all stop motion animation and yeah. with Harryhausen being the, the king of that, that was like an homage to him having the crazy mad doctor named after him. And I got to, I was Carmen Electra's bodyguard eight ball. And uh, oh, I got to have a big, I got to, uh, I got to battle a hundred foot long praying nice? mantis in a bulldozer. Uh, I got to have a fist fight with the, the, creature from the black lagoon uh and i got to do all this stuff in that in that movie and you know it's like you with each of these films as crazy and as over the top they are they just continually find something for me to do and which you know, is like i said amazing. I, and on that on that film they had to, because everything was stop motion animation, they had to build uh, maquettes of my character. So there's a, a version of my character that was about, you know, about that tall. And then there's another one about that tall that they could maneuver me and put me in different scenes. Like when the uh, the black, this, this flying ant comes in and steals Carmen Electra off the stage. And then I run out to protect her and it grabs me too and flies away. So they had, they had to have me kicking and screaming as it's flying away with me. And my wife, when she found out that I was going to be playing Carmen Electra's bodyguard, I was going to be hanging around with her all day. She oh, goes, she was probably sure. pissed. And she said, you make sure that they know you're married. And I went to the director and I said, uh, eight balls married. So I had to make, I had my wedding ring is in the film. And then I went to the special effects guys and I told them we need to, it has to be clear that eight ball is always married. So even on my little maquettes that they made, they painted in the little, the little gold ring and everything. 
I mean, my wife was only kidding, but I took it fully serious, you know, and I made sure that there was no second guessing the fact that I was married because she was a, she was a handful. She was a. (laughs) I was going to say, was she nice? I was thinking she was going to be like, oh. She was friendly, uh, but, you know, we we didn't have long conversations. Let's just say that. Uh, Sure. She uh, she had her uh, her her assistant who was always running around getting her a diet coke because she lived on (laughs) diet coke, and you know she I remember she there you go I remember she came to set with a a stack of uh, stuff magazines because I think she was in stuff magazine that week, and she kept asking if anybody wanted a signed copy. And then, 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 you know, signing the copies of them and giving them to people, which fine, whatever. But it was just, it was a, it was it. It's usually the other way around, you know, people bringing yeah. copies <laughs> to them. She's trying to give away copies of a magazine that she was in, although y'all are there to shoot a film. What the yes. hell? <laughs> and it it was funny. It was like when the movie started, it was going to be um, Christina Aguilera was going to be the the ma- the female lead because it was supposed to be about a rock concert. And it was, this thing was for MTV. Ah, that makes sense. Yeah. Completely wrong audience because this was for the audience of people who are fans of the movies from the 50s and who understood the. The, the the kind of effects and the and the the, the humor and everything, and yeah. the MTV crowd was like, well, "This movie's stupid. The effects are so <laughs> fake. You can clearly tell that that's a plastic ant." And it's like <laughs> you completely missed the point. So it was the wrong audience. But it was the funny part was when we first started, it was going to be Christina Aguilera. Then we got word that it was going to be Little Kim. Oh man. Then, so it kept going down. And then by the time we were getting ready to shoot, we found out it was going to be Carmen Electra who's going to be singing and performing at this concert. And the joke on set was, who's next? The person that gets kicked off American Idol? You know, it's like right. how much? <laughs> Who and even then knew that, Carmen that... could sing? Well, no, well exactly. <laughs> but she does. <laughs> But the uh, the, the funny part that. was, that it's funny how my my joke about American Idol ended up becoming true because when we ended up doing Scooby Doo Two Monsters Unleashed, there was the whole time we were shooting the film. Oh yeah, at the end was, of the film, Ruben Stutter. At the end of the film, there was going to be this big cameo. So while we were shooting the film, there was all this talk about all these different pop stars, and maybe it's going to be Britney, and maybe it's going to be this person, and maybe it's you know like, there was it talk, wasn't Britney. Just saying. So there was talk of all these things. And like two days before we shot the scene, they had the big uh, finale of American Idol. Yeah. And Ruben stuttered one. So then I was so it was happy like, about that too. He was so good. <laughs> so all of a sudden it was like, we got to get him. So they got him and he flew in and he did his cameo in the thing. And Then it was like, as we were waiting for the film to come out, it was like, are people even going to know who Ruben Stardard is by the time the film comes out? You know, it's like, because when you're making it, it's all in the news and it's all that anybody's talking about. It's huge. But you're like, that's a that's a dangerous move when you know you take someone from a from a game show, basically, put them in the movie, and then (laughs) you know, fingers crossed that people knew who Ruben Stardard was by the time the movie came out. Which they did, and it was fine. It was such a short little thing at the end. It was a little bizarre. It was like, and ladies and gentlemen, Ruben stuttered. I was like, okay. I mean, good for him. He's in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, first of all, he's not going to say no. Yeah, well, exactly. I mean, hands down, you know, the, the, the sequel was very, very successful. Super successful. Everybody fucking loved it. Probably I think it was so better than the first, than the first one. one. Yeah, I think it's better than the first one. I, I think it was too. more of a Scooby Doo episode. It was it really more... felt that way. Yeah, yeah. I Whereas like the way the first you know, one. Coolsville, you know, 
uh, got pissed off at them all. <laughs> they were like, well, public enemy number the, one. <laughs> Coolsville, in the museum, all the characters you see in the museum, when we started shooting that film, not when we started shooting it, in prep, when we started doing all the, uh, the makeup and everything, all of those monsters you see in the museum were going to be in the film. They were all realized. They all had realized makeups. All yeah. the different kind of chick, Chickenstein and the Creeper and Redbeard's Ghost and the Witch Doctor and all these famous characters from the Scooby Doo series. They all the actors were hired. All the makeups were designed. We went through all the makeup fittings. We went through all the different camera tests, and with each camera test. They would ixnay a bunch of ghosts, and then we go to another camera test, and they'd ixnay a bunch of ghosts for whatever reason. I think it was probably cost because of we were yeah. doing everything with practical effects. And sure. the, the thing we eventually kept cutting them down. But the good thing for me was, it's like as they would cut different ghosts, if there was gags that those ghosts had that they liked. They would just pass them on to the, the remaining ghosts. So all of a sudden, Minor 49er breathes fire. Why? Well, because Redbeard's ghost, who breathes fire, all of a sudden, he wasn't in the film anymore. But we like the fire gag. We'll give it to Minor 49er. So now I'm Why breathing not? fire in the film. And so now I got a scene with uh, with uh, uh, Freddie Prince Jr. as he tries to escape me breathing fire on him. And uh, so... See, the thing is, with, with the monsters, if they decide to go CGI, this happened to me with uh, uh, Percy Jackson in The Sea of Monsters. I was cast to play one of the main monsters in that film uh, wow. called Boar Man. I was half wild boar, half like yeah. warrior. And I went down to L.A., down to uh, uh, ADI makeup, and they did the whole makeup design. I went and got contact fittings and everything, had all these the stuff done in LA came back up here to Vancouver and we had the makeup tests and the camera tests. And then I get the phone call that says they're going CGI with all the ghosts. I mean, with all the monsters mm -hmm. and all the monsters that were created for the film were out. And because you can worry about what the monsters look like after the fact, if it's CGI, you know, right. you don't even need to know what monsters you're going to have. You're just going to have your bunch of actors running around screaming at tennis balls and red dots. <laughs> and then you can figure out later what monsters you're going to put in the film. So you're not marrying yourself to something. Like when no. with 13 ghosts, all the ghosts were practical makeups. So it was Which, never not going to be. That was the best part about it. Yeah, because... Uh, as you know, when you watch a movie that's all CGI, there's a disconnect. The actors, there's a blankness in their eyes because they're not reacting to anything. In nope. 13 Ghosts, when you see Matthew Lillard reacting to a six foot six baby with an axe and puke all over him, there's no, there's no acting involved. He's seeing that because I'm standing right there. And all yep. of, you know, the, the, the hammer, you know, with all the spikes in him and the jackal with the cage on the face and everything, everything you saw, the actor saw legit. and had to react to. Yeah. And it would have been a completely different movie if that had been CGI and all added later. Nothing. You would have just had a bunch of people doing empty reactions. But I think there's something about, I always say this, when you're reacting with another human being, it's like their soul is bouncing off your eyes. It's like yeah, there's a there's something happening there that, that is absent when you see a, when you, some of these big superhero movies where they're acting against green screen. There's something missing. Ah, when someone yeah, jumps, sure. when an actor jumps off a cliff, there's there's no oh my god because you know it's not a real guy. It's it's a cartoon character jumping off the cliff. But you go back 20 years, <laughs> so you've got true. some live act, some live actor running and diving off a cliff. You can tell it's a real guy. And you're like, mm. oh my God, you know, there's tension that's added. When you watch Spider-Man and it's just a cart, it's like it's a movie, but the reality is that you're just watching a cartoon. And then at the end of the last shot, they 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 cut into the guy who plays Spider-Man, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank so, God that I came up. I came up in an era of uh, 
of practical effects because, you know, I got to do a lot of that. You know, my my even in my what my character in Once Upon a Time in the second episode when they had the big dark curse, I played the ogre. I was one of the the queen's minions helping her create the dark curse, and I got to do an amazing makeup on that film as the ogre. And then the next season they were going to have there I am there. I mean that's an amazing makeup and the razor sharp teeth and everything. Yes. And you don't get to see any of that in the episode because it happened so quick. They basically just cut to me. I pulled the hair off my head. I put it in her basket and that's it. And they were going to have the ogre show up in other episodes. And then they decided to have the ogre wars. That, and they said, don't worry, we're going to have the ogre wars next season. And then over the summer, I get a call that says, oh, by the way, they've decided to go CGI with the ogre. And now instead of that amazing makeup, all you saw was a cartoon drawing for the, the next season. And there's a disconnect. All of a sudden, the actors aren't looking at me. You know? Right. And so then they, I got to play the uh, the Storybrook the Storybrook uh, version of the ogre. When they got when I got brought over with the Dark Curse, I was the maintenance man at the city hall where Regina was the mayor, and I did one episode as that. And they gave me the original name of Burly Man, which I always kills me. It's like. <laughs> The only time I ever see the word burly is in a script or in a character breakdown. Nobody right. uses the word burly except script writers. And Definitely. the amount of times that I've auditioned for a burly guy. <laughs> I mean, at that point, you might as well just say uh, the, the fucking big guy. <laughs> or just call me the maintenance man. I'm I'm wearing blue blue coveralls for the whole episode. That's right. You know? Or the handyman. Now that's cool. Yeah. And then the... Uh, so then when they wrote out the ogre, I said, well, is that, is that it for me? And I said, I'm going to make sure that's not it for me. So I grew a beard and all of a sudden they bring me in to play Jorge Garcia's brother. And he's playing uh, the, the, the giant from Jack and the Beanstalk. Yeah. And they hire me to play his brother because he's, they, we consider him tiny because he's so short and we're all, all monsters. So Abraham, Ben, Ruby, and me, and we're all the guys that are playing the, the brothers are like way over six feet tall. And then Jorge Garcia, uh, we call him tiny. So <laughs> I got to come back for the third, for the second season as a complete. So I'm one, I'm one of the only actors on Once Upon a Time who's played three separate characters. So it's always little trivial things like <laughs> Oh, yeah. So out of all these fascinating characters, multi-genre uh, TV and film, which one is, is kind of your favorite? Did you more so enjoy being all those monster characters or did you enjoy just kind of like being yourself and just, you know, playing some simpler characters? Uh, it's funny as I'm looking at this photo on the on the screen, I'm thinking of it's like I haven't even touched on so many characters that I've played. So many. Like I see my I see my helmet there. I played one of the Tremor brothers in Smoke and Aces. I was in Smoke and Aces too. I played Baby Boy Tremor, and I this think I enjoyed playing Love that, that character a lot because. My father was played by a great character actor, Michael Parks, who's yep. no longer with us. And he became, he was famous in the 50s and the 60s and a lot of Grindhouse films and stuff in the 70s. And then he sort of, you know, was doing the odd TV movie here and there. I mean, he was on Twin Peaks and, and mm -hmm. um, playing a French guy. But it wasn't until Quentin Tarantino brought him back in uh, some of his films. And then he was in a bunch of his films. And I was so glad to get to work with him on that because he played my father. And we had such a connect. My he, he was a bit of a drinker in real life. And my dad was a bit of a drinker. And it, there was a lot of like, I, I sort of understood his dysfunction, if that makes any sure. sense. And yep. so the father-son relationship on set became real to me and when we were not even when we weren't shooting on set uh there was a lot of like he would talk to me in the same way that my dad talked to me like it was like 
it was like oh, a put okay. down, but it was like a loving put down. Like he was, you know, you, you know, it's like, you know, he's like ribbing me all the time. Yeah, and, yeah. And I totally know how to be around someone like that because it really sure. brought back my relationship with my father, which wasn't the best. But, you know, it's like you have a lot of fun memories when you have uh, alcohol in your past with with a relative there's a lot of fun memories but then you got to remember that a lot of those fun memories were were based in huge dysfunction so it's like you have uh, that funny time that i went my dad took me out for lunch and we went back to school and i got to sit on the hood of the car as we drove up into the school and you think back and you go wait a minute I probably shouldn't have been on the hood of the car. Why was I on the hood of the car? Oh, because my dad thought it was funny. And my dad had a few drinks at lunch. And, you know, it's like, so you have all these funny stories that you remember from your childhood. And then when you get yeah. older and you look back, you go, wait a minute. Shit, <laughs> Maybe I, I shouldn't did have that. been on the hood. <laughs> so <laughs> that just reminded me because the school that yeah. I went to at the time just brought back a memory to something that you said earlier about you being what did you say 289 to how much did you say your your weight was oh i'm uh that's me right now 289 six foot two <laughs> yeah so that just brought i just remembered that just now because the same school i went to that school i started in grade six and when i started in grade six i was six foot three 286 pounds so, wow so i just Tying everything together, I just remembered you saying what how big you were, and it just reminded me that that's how big I was when I went into grade six. So <laughs> I've always I've always been a monster, and I'll tell you, from the age of fifteen, no, from the age of twelve to the age of sixteen, my age and my shoe size were the same. And I'll oh tell you, goodness. when I was like 14, 15, 16 years old. I can't, I'd have nightmares about being 30 years old and having size 30 shoes because there was no concept in my teenage brain that told me at some point your shoes are going to stop, your feet are going to stop growing. It's like, right. well, from the age of 12 to the age of 16, they didn't change. So I just, I, I would panic and go, oh my God, when I'm 20, I'm going to have size 20 feet. Well, thank God that never happened. But it could have stopped a little sooner. 16 is not an easy shoe to find. You know, uh, in, no. in Canada, yeah. I always get, well, you could go down to the States. Like, <laughs> should I have to leave my own country? <laughs> um, hell no. Let's not we do used, that. We used to have the Vancouver Grizzlies. We had an NBA team here, and I couldn't even get shoes. Ah, damn. And then our Grizzlies went to Memphis because, you know, Memphis is famous for its Grizzlies. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, my favorite character, I love the baby boy Tremor because of who I got to work with and because it was a fun character to basically create. I love when a director gives you enough freedom to just, you know, and because Joe Carnahan, that was his creation, and he didn't direct it, but he was the executive producer on the film. Mm -hmm. And we had such a good, he loved my work so much that when he came to shoot the A-Team, um, I get a call that says, Joe Carnahan is offering you a role in the A-Team. He wants you to come out and create this character. So I didn't even audition for the A-Team. Joe Carnahan just basically offered me the role because of my work on, on Smoke and Aces 2. So for yeah. anyone that says, you know, you're not a success, you're not famous, you're not on Entertainment Tonight, you're not on this, you're not on... It's like, I have directors writing roles for me. I'm happy. You, you know? I, that to me, is a success, you know? It, it, it is. And, and that's what I, you know, that's how I kind of approached indie film, you know, just starting to get into it as far as, you know, the horror genre, of course. Um, you don't necessarily have to be a main character to have a long-lasting career. I mean, your yeah. body of work speaks for itself. So yeah, for no, every okay. big guy out there in Black Flame land that thinks that, oh, I don't have the right build. I'm not buff. I'm not this. Bullshit. Fucking yeah. go out there. Someone's going to notice your size and say, I yeah. need that guy. 
just just be prepared to uh, not eat anywhere but Wendy's. Because, or uh, <laughs> <laughs> you might be working a lot, but you'll have a lot of uh, a lot of time in between those jobs where you're. You know, it's funny. Is I, I joke with my wife all the time. It's like, you know, one day you're 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 having lunch with a bunch of famous movie stars and millionaires and you're all you're all equals and you're sitting at the table together and two days later you're collecting empties and taking them to the uh, bottle exchange because you have no money to buy some pizza you know it's like it's the ups and downs of this business but you know it's the it's the ups that keep you in it and get you through the downs you know it's like my last film was crawl space i shot that in the summer of 21 that's the last thing i worked on you know so uh, i'm getting i'm starting to get uh, a, li a little rusty here and uh you know the strikes the strikes no didn't help but now that the one is True. uh worked itself out and the other one hopefully will work itself out and you know even though i'm up up in canada you know, we're primarily a, a service industry for the, the the big juggernaut that lives below us, you know, Hollywood. And so, you know, even though we have our own projects up here and we have everything, you know, it's when uh, it's when the big when the big money comes to town that all of a sudden the, the big shows come in. And the great thing for me is because I have a I haven't had to leave Vancouver. I've worked in the States and I've worked in different by shot uh Capote, I shot that in Winnipeg, Manitoba. I shot some commercials in Denver. I've shot, I've been to LA, and if so, but I get to base myself out of Vancouver because you know enough stuff comes to town, and when they want a specific specific type or a specific person, and you know a lot of directors like Brian Levant, I've worked with four or five times. A lot of directors come back and they want to work with me again. Brad Anderson, I've worked with twice, uh, so. It's always nice to make relationships because they're not getting to know you as a Canadian actor or a Vancouver actor. You're just getting to know them as an actor and they're a director or they're a creator and, and you're someone that can help them. I've produced, as uh, I said to you earlier when we were talking, I've produced three or four mm -hmm. features and a bunch of short films. And so I try to keep myself busy when I'm not on, on camera. I like to create work and uh, some interesting projects, mostly with uh, my producing partner, Anthony Harrison. We Our newest one is called Exuvia. And uh, nice. we're trying to get, we're doing the, we, we, we tried to send it out to a bunch of festivals, but it's just so hard to get into festivals. It doesn't matter how good your film is. It's like, you know, we have, uh, we've received 5,000 films and we have 22 spots, you know. Right. So, you know, it's like you start realizing that, that you start realizing <laughs> that, you know, as a producer, you're doing nothing but uh, throwing money at entry fees. And sometimes it's just like, you know, take a step back and realize that, you know, there's enough avenues out there now. You can put your film on something like Film Hub and get them to uh, put your film on different things like Tubi and whatever, because it at the at, at when it comes right down to it, it's about getting eyeballs for your project. It's not about the money you're going to make or not make, you know, unless you're a studio, just take money out of the equation. You're doing it because you love to do it. You know, when right. the last film that, that Anthony and I produced Exuvia, we were the only crew for like 95% of the movie, you know, he was directing and I was holding the boom mic and doing the sound recording and, you know, we were the only crew. So it was just him and I and a bunch of actors. And we went out and shot a feature film. Why? Because we like making movies and we love the experience of getting Passion. up in the morning and going. And, you know, the film hasn't gotten released yet, but that was, that was secondary to making the film. And, you know, at some point you got to make money because you got to pay to make these films. You know, That's even right. when you make them on the, even when you make them on the cheap, you know, ten thousand dollars is still a lot of money, and uh, well, ten grand. Yeah, it's got to come from somewhere, and usually it comes from uh, our savings. You know, from the the shows. Like my wife jokes, she calls her wedding ring her Scooby ring, because <laughs> uh, you know when when you're the kind of actor that I am, where you know you have a career of of 
big parts in small films and small parts in big films. And every so often a big paycheck comes along. And what ends up happening is all the items in your house start being connected. Like that, that's our Dudley do right uh, uh, entertainment unit. And that's our Scooby-Doo <laughs> ring. And uh, that's our dream catcher couch. And, uh, you know, when I worked on. Uh, yeah, because it paid for those uh, things. When I, <laughs> when I was supposed to be on. Uh, Percy Jackson's Sea of Monsters, we had already decided because we were going to shoot Vancouver and then I had to get a U.S. work permit because then we were going to shoot down in New Orleans at the uh, their big amusement park that ended up mm-hmm. going under because of Katrina. So it's just sitting right. there rusting away. So we were going to shoot there. And I, in retrospect, I'm like, oh, my God, I would have been in like. 40 pounds of prosthetic makeup in August in, in New Orleans. Oh. <laughs> Would have lost some weight then. <laughs> yeah. So it's that's when having a pay or play contract works out for you because you're like, we're not uh, going to use you, but we still have to pay you. <laughs> so all of a sudden, the brand new car that we were going to buy turned into a used car that we were going to buy. But now I didn't have to work on the movie. <laughs> so. That's right. So well, man. It, uh, there's a lot of a lot of opportunity for people to get into this business. You know, get yourself on set, whether it's a, a big production or a small production. The first place you got to be is you just got to be there. So get yourself some work as extra work. Do, you know, help out on a friend's film. Do as a, as a grip or whatever, as a production assistant, because then all of a sudden they'll need someone to fill a role. And then you're there. And then the next thing you know, you know, someone else saw you. That's the biggest thing is like when you work on indie film, the guy who's a grip on this film will be directing his own film in a year, you know, yeah. and the person who was was on one position on this. And if you make a connection with them and you remember them and they remember you mostly, then you'll get a call a year later. Go, I worked with you on that thing. Do you remember me? Yes, I remember you. <laughs> and that's why I've always tried my hardest to make human connections with everybody that I work with. I don't I don't believe in this whole hierarchy of you know it's like oh. once you reach a different rung you know when you, when i've worked when i've worked as extra humble. when i've done extra work that's where i've noticed this because uh the way a lot of the crew like especially like catering and stuff they'll go hey, 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 hey that's the that's the table for the cast and crew the extras you're gonna get some uh old donuts and coffee in about two hours you just go back to your tent and you stay away from this <laughs> You know, that kind of stuff. I remember on Outer Limits, I was one of the the supporting characters in that episode. But but because I was dressed up in full makeup, they don't know who I am. And we're shooting a scene at a big alien convention where where there's probably about 200 people in costumes, all in different makeups and everything. And I... I had I was at the end of my rope. I had been told I couldn't go this way, I couldn't go that way all for this whole 3 days that we were shooting at this big convention hall because I'm in full makeup. They just assume that I'm one of the one of the extras, one of the background. And yep. the amount of times that I got told I couldn't have something from the catering truck, I couldn't have something from the craft service table, I finally snapped and I try to be the nicest guy, but sometimes I just reach the end of it and the 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 production assistant, I, I felt bad afterwards, but he said, you, you, you can't have that. That's only for cast and crew. Extras, go over there. <laughs> and I said, oh, well, then I got a pretty big fucking trailer for an extra. <laughs> <laughs> and then afterwards, I felt bad for snapping on the guy. He's just doing his job. He doesn't know. But for you sure. know, when you're playing these characters where you're in full makeup, you it's, it, you try your hardest to, to keep some level of human dignity because after a while, like I said, they just see the character. They don't see the actor under the makeup. So you're right. constantly trying to to try to bring some human dignity to this thing. It's like, could you at least treat me like the actor that's in here and not like the right. character? You know, it's like if you're, if you're hanging around on set dressed as you are right now, for example, after after a few minutes, you forget what you look like, you know. You, yeah, you're just you, 
and you forget what you, and so when I'm wearing all this makeup, like on one of these monsters or something, like I remember in Fangoria, uh, Matthew Lillard said he couldn't go to the lunch tent at lunch because he would get sick when he'd look over and there's minor 49er with all the puke running down his face because that doesn't magically come off when I go to eat lunch. So right. I'm just sitting there eating my <laughs> peas and my potatoes with my puke all over my face. There's nothing I can do about it, but I don't think about it because I've lo- I've forgotten what I looked like hours ago. So right. I'm just an actor in the, it's everyone else who's looking at having the, the, having to look at me. So it's like constantly reminding you, it's like every so often you just have to walk by a mirror to remind yourself of what you look like. You know, I lose sight. You're like, oh, wait a second. I'm in my underwear. It's like, I might be uncomfortable to people. Maybe I should put a robe on. You know, it's right. like, you know, you know <laughs> I mean, I, I don't see my, my, my wife makes fun of me. She always says, you're so afraid to walk past an open window if you're in your underwear or something because you're afraid someone might see you. She says, people have seen you 40 feet high in your underwear. You know, it's like, <laughs> what are you afraid of? And I always say, no, that's. The great child, the guy yeah. walking past his window at home, at sea or it's Tarth. I don't need people outside knowing what I look like inside my apartment. It's not the same thing. You know, that's nope. a character. That's a costume. This is real life. Whereas my wife just sees me in my underwear. She doesn't see the difference. <laughs> but it's... Uh, it's been a it's been a fun ride, and like I said, it's been a couple of years since I've worked, but that's uh, that's just because of between the uh, between the pandemic and then just as the pandemic ends, uh, well, it's starting up again. So uh, there's really <laughs> we haven't gotten to the end yet. We've just you know moved on. That's what we've done. Um, You'll bounce uh, back. Yeah. So. There's, it, there's just been a huge downtime. So I'm just waiting for, I've got one film in the can that I did, American Dreamer, where I got to work with Peter Dinklage. Uh, I took that because it's more or less a sight gag. You know, my size compared to his size, we're both in the same scene together. But I took that. I knew it would it would be a small little cameo, but I knew it would be fun. And I wanted to work with Peter Dinklage. I think he's a great actor. And that was during the during the uh the worst of the uh the pandemic when we shot that too so that was like you know getting rammed up the nose every <laughs> twice a day and getting all the testing done but i'm just glad that we were continu- we were able to continue working and making entertainment for people it was just a lot of a lot of sticks up my brain i'll tell you <laughs> well I, you know, I got to say thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, It has been just a wealth of information. Um, You know, a lot of people that tune into Reapers Underground, they are, you know, indie actors, uh, a lot of them, and just a a wealth of knowledge, just an inspiration. It has been an amazing time talking with you tonight. Um, We've loved every character you have ever played. And for those that, you know, didn't know you before they do now. And I guarantee they're going to go back, especially, you know, 13 ghosts, you know, any horror fan that is on their list of at least top five. It's definitely. I just want to say, I just want to say before I go that um, I, a lot of conventions, a lot of conventions that I haven't been able to go to and a lot of conventions that people wanted to see me at, um, so what I've been doing lately is I've been selling my convention prints online. Yes. So uh, if people want to go to Sea Ernst Hearth on Facebook, I have it pinned to the top of my page. And my characters from all these films that we've been talking about, I have 8 by 10s And most of the pictures that you've been showing are my convention prints. And it's $30, shipping's included. I'll sign it for you however you want. I can personalize it. I can put some character quotes, whatever you want on it, and uh, send it out to you. And then you don't have to uh, wait in line to see me at a convention. You can uh, get get personal one-on-one and uh, drop me a line and uh, tell me what you're interested in, and uh, we'll get it out to you. And thanks for having me. Losing my voice here. My ball of water has (laughs) gone. You've just, you've given us so many 
memorable, standout characters, no matter how crazy or how simple. Every last one of them just amazing. You're an amazing talent. And uh, I really appreciate you coming on the show tonight. Uh, And to everyone out there in Black Flame land, go watch his movies. Nine times out of ten, you've seen them all but didn't realize that that was him. So to all of us that, you know, are, are getting into the business and, you know, wanting to play characters like this, we appreciate all your work, your dedication, your passion. Um, as far as I'm concerned, no, no award is that necessary to say that you have had a phenomenal career. And to everyone out there, you can too. You just got to get out there in the dirt and be yourself. So everybody out there in the comment section, you guys have been f- absolutely phenomenal. Oh my goodness. I'm losing. I can't even speak now. Words are hard. <laughs> you there, guys I, just did my 13 go- I just did my 13 ghost audition for you. Yep. You sure did. And damn it. I remember that. So as <laughs> everybody out there is closing their night out with visions of C. Ernst Hearth's eyeballs, just now the great child. Dancing in your head, the most important thing that you must remember is to stay heavy. Ah!